Hi, my name is Diasha. In this lesson, we will take our first good look at gases. You might not think so, but you already know a lot about gases. Air is a gas, actually a mixture of several gases. It surrounds you all the time. Yet on a clear, calm day, you cannot see, smell, feel, taste or hear the air you live in. You cannot see air because the gases in it are colorless. The gases in clean air have no smell either. However, many gases have characteristic smells and some are colored too. Although air is a mixture of several different gases, it behaves very much like any single pure gas. Different gases such as chlorine and nitrogen dioxide behave in different ways chemically. But all gases behave in remarkably similar ways when they undergo physical changes. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain some aspects of gas behavior at a microscopic level. When you hold your hand palm up like this, the column of air you're holding in your palm stretches about 80 k's up into the sky. Yet you don't feel the mass of this air. Is this because air has no mass? Let's see. Look at these two balloons hanging from the straw. Do you see that the straw balances horizontally? This means that the balloons have the same mass. I'm going to take this balloon off the straw and blow it up like this. Now, I'll put it back on the straw. Look what happens now. The side of the straw with the inflated balloon tips down. The inflated balloon is now heavier, has more mass, than the uninflated balloon. This extra mass must be the mass of the air I blew into the balloon. This is a macroscopic observation. What does this macroscopic observation tell us about particles in the air? It tells us that particles, molecules and atoms in our air sample have mass just as all particles have. The animation represents the particles making up the gas as spheres. In reality, the particles making up most gases are not spheres at all. But the particles making up all gases behave as if they were hard spheres, not soft spongy ones. This syringe contains 20 centimeters cubed of chlorine. Watch what happens when we put the chlorine into this glass bottle. Do you see that it spreads out through the air in the bottle and after a short while mixes completely with the air in the bottle? This macroscopic observation tells us that the chlorine molecules must be moving from one place to another through the air in the bottle. In the animation we can see and then describe how the particles in a gas move. One of the gas particles is now red so that you can focus your attention on it. Watch this red particle for a while. Does it move in circles? Not at all. It moves in a straight line until, look, it's bumping into another particle, quite by chance. And then instantly it bounces off that particle. It doesn't stick to it at all. Then our red particle changes direction and moves off in a straight line until it bumps into another particle by chance. Now it's bumping into the container wall and then instantly bounces off the wall. Imagine the endless bumping and bouncing taking place in the air around you and the endless bumping into your body and bouncing off your body. An oxygen molecule in the air around you typically collides about 7,000 million times each second. Lucky you can't feel all this bumping and bouncing. Now let's compare the movement of different particles. Are they all moving in the same direction? No, of course not. At any instant, there is likely to be a gas sample moving in all possible directions. We call this completely haphazard, irregular motion of particles, random motion. Does it look like all the millions and millions of particles in the air-chlorine mixture in the bottle move at the same speed? This is very unlikely. It is as improbable as it would be to expect that all the cars in the world are moving at exactly the same speed. Some would be moving very slowly, others far too fast. But you would be likely to find many cars somewhere in the world moving at, say, 60 kilometers per hour, others moving at 61 kilometers per hour, and others at 64 kilometers per hour, and so on. In fact, at any instant, you could find a car moving at any reasonable speed somewhere on Earth. Experimental evidence exists that tells us that the same is true for the particles in all gases. They are chlorine molecules and air molecules moving over a very wide range of speeds. The slowest moving particles move really slowly. 
The fastest moving particles move amazingly fast. That is why we must describe the average speed at which particles in our sample move. It is an unbelievable 481 meters per second, which is 1,730 kilometers per hour. This is much faster than most aeroplanes can fly. Amazing! The very high average speed of gas particles under normal room conditions suggests that a gas would travel across a room in an instant. You know from experience that if you open a bottle of a smelly gas in one corner of a room, you won't smell it at the other side of the room for a few minutes. It takes so long because each molecule travels only a short distance before it collides with another particle and so changes direction. And remember how often this happens. This diagram represents the path that a molecule of the smelly gas may follow when it moves from A to B. Truly random motion. Did you notice that when we mixed the chlorine and the air, that the chlorine is paler in the bottle than it is in the syringe? But the color is the same everywhere in the bottle. The chlorine doesn't collect in the air at the bottom of the bottle or at the top. This macroscopic observation of the gas mixture tells us that the same number of chlorine molecules spread out evenly as a result of their movement. Air particles must spread out evenly too. The same number of chlorine molecules occupies a bigger volume in the bottle than they did in the syringe. So, the chlorine molecules must be more spread out further apart in the bottle. That's why the color is paler. The chlorine has no shape of its own. It fills the bottle completely, just as it fills all the available space in the syringe. This explains why there is no space around you that there is no air. The way chlorine and air mix so easily tells us another thing about gases. There must be plenty of space between the particles in the air and between the chlorine molecules too. The particles in the gas are much smaller than the distance between them. The volume of the spheres is very, very tiny compared to the volume the gas as a whole occupies. We can stop the motion of the gas particles in the animation to show this more clearly. Look, when we do this, the particles pack closely together at the bottom of the container. Compare the volume that the particles occupy with the volume of their container. It's tiny. In fact, more than 99% of the volume occupied by the air around you is empty space. This explains why gases have very, very low densities. A volume of one cubic centimeter of air close to the ground has a mass of only 0 0,00012 grams. Now look at this gas jar of nitrogen dioxide. The gas jar has been standing for days and days, but the nitrogen dioxide has not sunk to the bottom of the gas jar. This macroscopic observation tells us something important about the nitrogen dioxide molecules. They not only move from place to place, they never stop moving from place to place. We call this uninterrupted motion, continuous motion. Like all moving objects, nitrogen dioxide molecules have energy, kinetic energy. The kinetic energy of the nitrogen dioxide molecules depend on their mass and how fast they are moving, their speed. Since the nitrogen dioxide molecules never stop moving, their average kinetic energy stays the same under these conditions. Let's find out what may happen to the kinetic energy of two particles in a gas when they bump into or collide with one another. These collisions are very different to the collisions we see in everyday life. Let's see how they are different. Watch the collisions between this rubber ball and the floor when the ball rolls off the edge of a table. Do you see that each time the ball bounces up from the floor, it raises to a lower height until eventually it stops bouncing and rolls along the floor. The change in shape of the ball tells us that the ball transfers energy to the floor each time it bounces on the floor. So when it rises again, it has less energy. After several bounces, it has too little energy to rise off the floor. Everyday collisions like this are not like the collisions between the particles in a gas. Watch this animation of two particles in a gas and you will see the difference. Do you see that the blue particle is moving much faster than the green one? They are on a collision course. Now they bump into each other. Instantly they bounce off each other. Their shape does not change when they touch. Do you remember that earlier we said that gas particles behave as if they were hard spheres, not squashy ones? 
That's why they don't change shape when they collide. Do you see that now the green particle is moving fast and the blue one is moving slowly? Together the particles have just as much kinetic energy after colliding as they had before they collided. We call collisions during which no energy is lost elastic collisions. Collisions between gas particles must be elastic collisions. If gas particles had less and less energy after each collision, as our rubber ball had, they would eventually stop moving. Then they would settle to the bottom of the container, where they would be closely packed as particles in liquids and solids are. Our nitrogen dioxide hasn't settled to the bottom yet, nor has it changed into a liquid. Next, we'll use the syringe. I'm going to seal the nozzle and push as hard as I can to see if I can squash the air in the syringe. I squashed it quite a lot. It was easy to make the volume occupied by the gas smaller. So, gases are compressible. Look at this. It will help us explain this macroscopic observation. The same number of particles in the sample of air move closer together when the area becomes smaller. This would be very difficult to do if each particle repelled its neighbor strongly, wouldn't it? The electrostatic forces pushing the gas particles apart must be very weak indeed. Now I'm going to try and pull the plunger out while I hold my finger tightly on the end of the nozzle so that no air can get in. What happened? I have increased the volume of the air in the syringe occupies. No more air got into the syringe, so the air inside the syringe must have expanded to occupy a bigger volume. The fact that gases are so compressible and so easy to expand tells us something important about the volume that any sample of gas occupies. Knowing the volume a gas sample occupies does not tell us the amount of gas, the number of particles, or the combined mass of the particles in the sample. The same number of particles in the air in the syringe can occupy whatever volume we want them to occupy. Now take a look at this table carefully because you'll have to complete one like it for your task. The heading in the first column is macroscopic observation. It describes some observation about gases. In this case, the observation is two gases mixed completely when we put them into a bottle of air. For your task, you will have to interpret this observation by filling in a sentence in the column headed Microscopic Interpretation. So, you could fill in Particles in gases are widely spaced. Or you could fill in Gas particles move. So, the word gas appears in the first column. The sentence that you write must include the word particle or particles. Good luck and goodbye for now.